set up to have a, a fellow named John Kurzweig. I think that was his name, John. It was Kurzweig. Uh, was going to produce me. And uh, he somehow had, he had recorded an album for Atlantic Records. And uh, um, Ken Scott had produced his record, which got me really excited because Ken Scott produced uh, the Beatles Revolver and produced uh, David Bowie, Hunky Dory, and um, Ziggy Stardust. Uh, he worked with Bowie on uh, Lou Reed's Transformer album that has Walk on the Wild Side on it. Um, Ken Scott is an old, old old world British gentleman producer, old school. I mean, used to do the kind of producing where you had two inch tape and you would go in and cut out with a razor blade little teeny sections of music, uh, old school producing, which was the kind of producing I did. Anyway, he was, he, Ken Scott, pretty cool. So uh, I fired John Kurzweig from my project and it was it was kind of mutual. He didn't understand my music and didn't really know what was going on. And he went on to produce Creed and their multi-platinum billion trillion selling albums. And I don't know what he's doing now, but he was a nice guy. He was a good guy. But uh, I got Ken Scott's home phone number somehow. And I used to call Ken Scott and talk to him on the phone. And I used to send him letters and I sent him some of my music and he really liked it. I sent him uh, the bottom line, uh, one day, uh, love plus politics, the new stuff that I was working on at that time. He was living in, um, I think, Malibu. And uh, he he was interested in working with me. He he was kind of in between projects, and uh, he said if we could find a hundred grand, uh, maybe we could do something. And I was pretty excited. Um, and I, I, I used to call him up on occasion and uh, talk to him about possibilities. And, uh, this is a story that really goes nowhere. But uh, I remember the last time I... I didn't talk to him, but the last contact, in a sense, that I had with him was... Uh, remember, David Bowie had, all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, David Bowie had a, a special on... Um, NBC, or on uh, network television. It was like a hour, two hour live concert. It was during, uh, I think at the beginning of his Glass Spiders tour. And um, Ken Scott was telling me, yes, he's, he's doing the grandfather rock thing. He's, he's into his, he's the grandfather of rock phase. Which is funny because Bowie wasn't that, that old at that time yet. Uh, probably in his late 30s. Um, early 40s maybe. Uh, anyway, this 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 special was on network television um, on a Friday night, and I and I was watching it. And Bowie came out, and he had some space boots on, and uh, it was all looking really cool. And I was really excited because I was thinking, and I'm going to have Ken Scott produce my debut album, and I'll get to meet Bowie, and um, maybe. Um, and I called up Ken Scott because I was so excited. I called him up during the, the thing and he, he answered the phone. Sounded kind of a, annoyed. He didn't know, they didn't have caller ID in those days, so he didn't know who was calling him. And uh, I think I'd had a little bit to drink and I was just feeling my oats. You know, this was back in my rock and roll days. And uh, uh, he, uh, he, um, he answered the phone. Hello, hello, or yeah, it was more, hello. Well, it didn't sound like that actually, but 
in his in his old gentlemanly British accent, uh, he answered the phone, and I wanted to talk about Bowie and and this and that and my project, and uh, <laughs> but I froze. And I felt really stupid, and I felt like I had just interrupted him watching the same special. And uh, you know, who was I calling up? Well, well, Dave's Dave is on was on the tele was on the telly, and uh, and I just sat there for a moment in this awkward silence, and then I hung up. And then shortly after that, uh, I think I heard that uh, his uh, there was a big fire in Malibu, and I lost contact with him. And, other things happened from then and there, but anyway, that's my Ken Scott story. While I'm uh, while I'm dropping rock royalty names here, uh, I might as well mention that that roughly that same time I was um, I was doing a cover of uh, the David Bowie song Diamond Dogs, and uh, at that same time I was. My, some of my financing was coming from um, John Browning, who was uh, this, the, the Browning Arms, you know, Browning Guns, World War One, Two, not three, but uh, Browning. That's a long story. How I hooked up with John Browning. Talk about old world gentlemen with his bow tie and me and my rock and roll get up. Uh, raising money for my projects, but anyway, he was uh, taking a gamble on me, and uh, so it, when I was covering, uh, doing my version of Diamond Dogs, which some people say is one of the best versions of Diamond Dogs that they've heard, including Bowie. Well, I didn't say that. They said it. Um, which I, I don't have available yet. I got to get the mechanical license thing figured out. But I'll, I'll put that I, I'll put that up on my uh, SoundClick site, my music site. It's a pretty it is a pretty good. The guitar work on it is amazing. Uh, Steve Taff, uh, my favorite guitarist I ever worked with. Uh, he was in a band called 911. Interestingly, and today is 911. So this is a uh, dental. Um, in that respect, but anyway, I recorded uh, Diamond Dogs, and in the in the uh, in the song, there's a there's a verse that says, um, "Crawling down the alley on your hands and knees, I'm sure you're not protected, but it's plain to see the Diamond Dogs poachers on the house." Let's see. Uh, anyway, there's a line in this says, "Todd Browning's freak he was," and Todd Browning, I guess, is one of Bowie's obscure references to I think a horror movie actor or makeup artist or somebody or some type of artist that created strange characters or something I can't remember but in my version if you listen closely I say John Browning's freaky was because I was so inside esoteric in what I was doing and tying it into Bowie's thing and Ken Scott in the wings and I'm I'm doing a cover of Diamond Dogs and so instead of Todd Browning's freaky was I said John Browning's Freaky Was, and you can listen for that in the song, and that that's a game you can play at home, is, is, is to, to listen to that reference, and uh, that, I don't think anybody in the world has ever heard that reference, except for my wife, because I pointed it out, and uh, uh, maybe a couple of my kids, um, but uh, yeah, so that's how that Oh, I'm thinking about it, uh, yeah, Steve Taff, Great guitarist, uh, one of the best. Him and Kent Ridding, the two best guitarists that I worked with. Uh, I don't know, at least, yeah. Uh, the Steve Taff. It was in Florida. Had a band called 911 at the time, with uh, three other guys. They were kind of the local bar band in uh, the Tallahassee College Main Street scene. Um, all of them were excellent musicians. But uh, if you want to hear Steve Taff's. Uh, guitar work. You can hear it on um, my songs uh, Captain Action, which I think is amazing <laughs> what he did. Captain Action, which is about the second coming. Um, Love Plus Politics, which is uh, about well, uh, he's on that song. Love Plus Politics, uh, which is about a theoretical politician guided by God uh, well, anyway, um, and, uh, and about the, the state of actual politics. Um, um, what other? Oh, he's on Supernatural Fire, and I smoke a pipe. 
and the Metropolis and uh, well Diamond Dogs and um, there's maybe a couple more but anyway excellent guitarist don't know where he is no idea what he's doing but uh, man I would have loved to have had a, a band uh, with him in it uh, his guitar he totally got what I wanted when I said I wanted animal monster guitar sounds uh, like Adrian Ballou, uh, you know, Elephant Talk. Um, if you're not a musician or ob obscure references, probably don't mean a lot. But uh, I like guitars that don't sound like guitars, okay? Um, and I used to describe things to them in these visual crazy terms. Like, I, wanna, I want this guitar solo to sound like a toaster that just caught on fire that somebody threw through a glass window and then landed in the pool. That's what I want the solo to sound like. And he would go, oh, okay, uh, let me try something. And then he'd do something really cool. Um, and I remember I was way into like early uh, sampling and sound effects in music. People weren't doing much of it like I was then. And he's, he, he came over one day after hearing one of our demo, my demo tracks of some stuff we'd been working on. And he's like, you know, this music you're doing is, a, I mean, it, I, I love it. I like it. It's, it's got all these sounds in it and all this strange stuff and I was trying to tell him and my publisher at the time and anyone else who would listen that's the future of music it's all gonna sound like that it's all gonna be eclectic a mix of different styles uh, sound effects uh, noises samples you know I've, I've got Hitler sampled in love plus politics I went to the video store and got a, v a VHS and literally sampled uh, off of tape um, isolated the phrase uh, in that song uh, um, and people I mean there was sampling going on at that time but not not for what I was trying to do and, and in uh, Captain Action that was a song where it's like funk kind of bluegrass rap rock and uh, synth pop all meshed in one and I sent it to my publisher at the time and he's like I don't know what uh, he was from Minnesota, and he's like, I don't know what to do with this. You know, it doesn't fit a category. And uh, I'm like, right. Let's get ignorant.